Welcome, everyone. I'm sure you had plenty of very technical presentation on Unreal. So I decided to do something a bit more personal on the art and the craft that it is to make video games. So my point is that I believe Unreal 5 and those tools are kind of a pen brush of the 21st century. And I'm going to talk about that through the example of the game we are making. So I am Renaud Charpentier. I am the founder of a French video game studio called Tower 5. And we are mostly a um, studio dealing with console games. And right now, we are using Unreal for the first time on a game called Empire of the Ants. It's a strategy game based on a series of French novels by uh, an author called Bernard Werber. And I'll start by showing you how it actually looks like. Product not yet rated. So, it's 2024, and we are actually waking up every morning to create a strategy game that is photorealistic in the insect world. So it's a bit sometimes being a stranger in a strange land. And my point is, how do you get to travel there, and how did I end up here? All of that are kind of valid questions. And actually, Making video game, I believe, and I think it's something understood now, is making art. It's a full, fully-fledged form of art, and you never do that without starting with influences. If you are a creator, you are shaped by key experience that you encountered at key moments in your life. When you encounter them, you don't exactly know that they are going to be that influent, but they are. Those experience transform in influence, and when you create, you usually reassemble some of these elements in what you are creating. For me, that's why I was saying it's quite personal talk, those two pictures would be K seminal influence. The first one, Le Voyage dans la Lune, is a still from a black and white French movie from 1902. It was groundbreaking at the time. Maybe you've seen this picture without even knowing what it was. It was the first practical special effect in the movie industry. And it struck me when I was a kid to see that on TV, and I thought, oh, OK, that sticked into my mind. The second one is a bit closer to what we all do. It's a video game. That was called Kung Fu Master in France. It's known as Spartan X in other country. And that's an arcade game from 1984. It was absolutely groundbreaking at the time. It has scrolling, great gameplay, fantastic graphic, animation, great sound design, and 
I played that game as an arcade cabinet, and I actually sunk my pocket money in it for an entire summer to try to finish it, and it stayed with me. Later on, after I discovered this uh, basically craft of art, I got interested in okay, but who did that? Who crafted those images that impressed me so much? It happened to be two geniuses. One was Georges Méliès, one of the French, I would say, spearheader of cinema. He made more than 600 movies. He invented techniques that all movie makers use these days, like overprint, fade, dissolve. He was almost the, the inventor of a technique called trompe l'oeil in French, which actually became matte painting, which is still used to these days. And the second person I only got to know about him decades later is Takashi Nishiyama, which is actually the designer and the creator of Spartanix. He's also a legend to me. He created more than 40 games, and among them you have games like Moon Patrol, Street Fighter, Mega Man, Kings of Fighters, and Metal Slug. If one of us had the chance to work only on a single of his game, that in a career that would be already quite legendary. He worked and designed all of these. And what I was digging a bit deeper on how these artists managed to do, create this piece of art that influenced me, I went into the, technali the technality of it, basically the craft that was behind the art. The first picture here is the first movie studio that ever existed in France. It was Méliès Studio and he created that in Paris to be able to shoot his first movie. The guy that you are seeing here are actually painting the backdrop of his movie, standing. And at some point, because color didn't exist at the time, Méliès had more than 200 workers that were manually colorizing each frame of each copy of its movie with stamp, frame by frame, for each copy of the movie. So very heavy craft to be able to generate that image. The second image is the actual bespoke printed circuit board of Spartan X. This one, if you connected it, maybe works again. In those days, each game had to have its own electronics, its own processor, audio chip, memory. You had to design all of that specifically for your game and then program it. The craft was very heavy. And in fact, what that made me thought about is that you always have a strong dependency, a symbiotic relationship between the art we are all trying to create, the people we are as creators, and the craft, the technique that we use. Those two other pictures were very important to me later on when I was a, a young man. One of my favorite pieces of art, one is taken from Barry Lyndon, which is a Stanley Kubrick movie. And the second one is one of the most famous paintings from William Turner, The Fighting Temeraire. The first one was shot in the 80s. And actually, it was the story of the Zeiss Planar, which is a specific lens that Kubrick had to use to be able to do this, to do this low luminosity shot. The second one, which is also a very tight link between the craft and the art, is how Turner used very specific pigment, and in that case, arsenic sulfide, also known as king yellow, to be able to paint that. So initially, to shoot Barry Lyndon, you could not shoot that in the 80s. The film was not reactive enough. So you had to find a lens that enabled that. And that's exactly what Kubrick did. But it's a long story of craft that led to that picture. Kubrick had reached to NASA, which he had worked on on uh, his previous movie. And it happened that NASA has worked with Zeiss, the Swiss company, to create this specific lens called the Zeiss Planar 50, for 50 millimeter. And when Kubrick was working on that, initially he wanted to do a Napoleon movie. But he couldn't, because there was an American movie about Napoleon that was unsuccessful. Hence, he decided to adapt Thackeray and his book. And Thackeray was a great friend of a British painter called Hogarth. And Hogarth was painting by candlelight. Kubrick had the Zeiss Planar, 
had to do camera engineering. He put that together with his intention for the movie and his perfectionism. And basically, he managed to shoot Barry Lyndon and that specific picture. Without that specific craft, we would never have seen that. For Turner, it's a, it's a question of King's Yellow and Gamboge. In those times, you had a company called Windsor and Newton, was one of the first in England to actually craft paint. Before that, all of the painters had to prepare their pigment themselves. Turner was very experimentative in his craft. He always cared how the picture would look like, and he would create his own colors, actually, including using aged beer, tobacco, anything. And it was instrumental that he could access to this new pigment, which at the time were products of chemical and import, King's Yellow and Gamboge, so he could actually paint the fight of the Temeraire. In short, a vision, if you want to express it, always demands a precise craft. Without mastery, there is no master art. That's just not possible. So, on Pierre Verhans, how, how did he come to that, and how is that linked to using Unreal? Basically, initially, it was based on a first-person novel. OK, you are an ant within an empire, and it's scenes in first person. So it's kind of entomologic realism. It's not a bug's life. It's not cartoony. It's actually pretty close to a BBC documentary. OK, without David Attenborough, but visually pretty close. So we decided to go for photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is not a light decision. It means very high polygon count, huge texture, and you also need realistic lighting, which means you need global illumination. OK, but that's going to be an RTS. So we, all, we are also going to have online multiplayer, which means we need to have a network engine that is proven. And that was in 2021. Unreal 5 only al already released its early access. And we looked at what it contained. Oh, it has an integration of QuickSell for photogrammetry pipeline. Check. Fantastic. That's the right tool. Lots of polygons. Well, there is this new technology that is called Nanite that is precisely meant to handle them and avoid having load. Check. Great. We're going to do it doing well. Global illumination. That's the other big feature. That's Lumen. Real-time global illumination. Oh, good. That's, that's done. And we need to check online capacity, capabilities. Well, basically, this engine is used to do Fortnite. So that's a small proof of concept that it can actually handle multiplayer. We had a PS5 dev kit, we managed to beam it on it, and we managed to have a first prototype. The very first prototype brought that world to life, what was still taken from it. We had to transition the team to Unreal 5, we were working with Unity before, and all of the key tech delivered, actually. So with the editor, we decided to continue to a vertical slice, 2003. 23 vertical slice, first prototype, we basically managed to have the gameplay and the art together. The art direction was becoming more precise. The gameplay simulation holds. We could test the multiplayer. Well, everything was fine. Let's move to production. Wait a little bit. Wait. We checked everything, but there is this problem with texture memory space. So basically, we are going to render on a 4K screen like this one. And we are very close to the assets. So it means some assets will require 8K textures, which is fine. But an 8K texture with all of this channel is about one gigabyte per texture. And actually, once the rest of the game is running, we add six gigabytes left of actual memory space on the PS5. So when you tell that to your art director and your tech director, usually they jump to your desk and are like, now we can't do a game with only six textures. That's never going to run. So there's a bit of despair and panics. And we're like, wait, there is this thing in Unreal, which is not a new feature. It's come from Unreal 4, which is called virtual texturing. It's precisely meant for that. So it's basically a system that splits the texture in, in, in different elements and then dynamically decides which one it should load in high resolution and which one it can keep in lower resolution. It's basically a lot system for textures. 
We are like, ah, good. Let's just activate it. Problem solved. And no, not at all. It had massive transition and sorting problem. Some of VT transient tiles take seconds to upload. Others stayed in low resolution when, in fact, they should have been in high resolution. The sorting of them was wrong, compared to the camera view. Bit of despair again. But we're like, we need that, and we have three things. Hopefully, we have the source. We have a clear art direction. We know what we want to get out of it, and we have great devs. So maybe putting a rendering wizard on it, we should be able to alter the code so that it does exactly what we want it to do. And that was a big question: Should we change the C++ code of the virtual texturing system? Because that means branching out of the engine, which is something you want to avoid. And actually, no. After some research, we could get the virtual texturing to work perfectly for us. It took some time for an engineer to find, to find how precisely, but in fact, the only thing we had to do was to tweak eight VT initialization parameters, these with these factors. Just don't copy them. That works for our game. That's surely not going to work for your game. But the thing is, and that was the big joy. Oh. We just need to learn to use the tool that is here better. The tool works perfectly. It's just that it can't be adapted exactly to what we do with it. You need to learn how to tweak it. We did that, and then we realized what you had. And that was a bit exactly the same as the Zeiss planner that Kubrick had to use to shoot Barry Lyndon. It didn't work immediately. The Zeiss planner couldn't be mounted in the standard camera at the time. It has to be very close from the film, and it posed them many problems. They had to create a bespoke adaptator to use it on the camera. Exactly the same way, we had to adapt the virtual texturing to our needs. What we discovered again is that no engine can respond exactly to your vision. The craft. The craft of development is to adapt your engine to the exact art that you are doing, and for that, most likely, you'll need the source file to know precisely how that engine works and how you can adapt the craft to your needs. Tools like Unreal 4 and all of the others that are displayed on this show floor should actually be seen as both the studio. The PCB, the pigment, and the lenses of the 20th century. The art that we do, and the artists that we are, work hand in hand with that craft. You have to master it. If you don't do it, and you decide to start without an engine or without pre-existing tech, it's a bit the same as if you are saying, "Oh, I'm going to shoot a movie in 2025." And I'm going to start by melting sand to build the lens. For us, that would be the same. That would be melting sand to actually build the processor. That doesn't make sense. Maybe it's a great experiment for some, but that doesn't stand for an industry. The last point is: don't expect that a tech, whatever tech you're going to use, even if it's an engine, a back-end tech, a server system, is going to be exactly perfect for you out of the box. It's impossible. The tech can't know exactly which precise piece of art you want to create. You'll have to test it, and most likely, you'll have to tinker with it. That's about it. Thanks for listening, and hope you enjoy Empire of the Ants later on when it releases as a piece of art. Thanks.